when there are people who become the allies of the Islamic Caliphate, they have a peace treaty with them and an agreement of peace, it becomes a responsibility upon the Islamic State to protect and to look after its allies. One of the things it does is that even if its allies were non-Muslim, if they had land that belonged to them, that was colonized or taken illegally by force from them, then the Islamic State now has a duty to help them regain their lands. Also, those lands that are regained go under the Islamic Empire to rule and take care of. But when Muslims used to take over land, brothers and sisters, they conquered it in a just manner and a fair manner, with minimum casualties as possible in the true sense. And they never dealt unjustly with its people. And it did not attack or oppress the weak or kill the women or children and the livestock. And when the people surrendered, they gave them lots of autonomy, freedom to practice their own religion in their land, they certainly never took the land of the indigenous people off them. If the land came under the rule of Islamic Empire, the people who were indigenous, like the Aboriginals, for example, or the American Indian, the, uh, the, um, the native Indians in America, they, if the Muslims had conquered that place, they would leave it to them and they would still practice their own faith and they would not destroy their places of worship. In fact, they assist them in maintaining it and they will just call them to Islam and invite them. And if they refuse, they don't force anyone. As Allah says in the Quran, Lesta alayhim bi musaytir. You cannot force people to your way. Laysa alayka hudahum. Their guidance is not upon you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal mawidatil hasana. Call to the path of your Lord with wisdom and with goodly and kind advice. And Allah says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no coercion or compulsion in religion to convert people by force. So, my brothers and sisters, they had a very unique way of conquering and taking over land of people and putting under the Islamic Empire and then giving its people the right and freedom and autonomy. That was unknown to the rest of the world in that time and for many centuries to come and even before that in the history of mankind. And the Persians in that time were the superpower, the Romans, the Byzantines was all, were also a superpower and honestly in true history they wreaked, they wreaked havoc on a lot of people and when they entered places like Egypt for example, there used to be the Copts over there. Until today the Coptics are still there, the Copts, Christian Copts and the Romans treated them quite harshly by making them pay huge taxes and they didn't give them good treatment as the Muslims did when they entered Egypt. Also the Christians of Jerusalem were mistreated by the Romans and we're going to talk about that today inshallah. Also the Persians, they mistreated them and killed and massacred and raped in the hundreds of thousands of them. So Muslims never did that and inshallah you will see today some more stories of that. So we left off where Umar al-Khattab and the army of the Muslims had now reconquered many of the Arab lands in Damascus, in greater Syria. It was called Damascus or Sham in that time. A Sham was a combination of Lebanon, uh, Syria, Jordan, Jerusalem, Palestine and bits of Turkey. That was all called greater Syria, a Sham or Transjordan. And in that time he took it over and there were still parts of it that were still under the Byzantine, the Roman Empire, who refused to either surrender, convert or have a peace treaty with the Muslims. So they were a threat and the war had begun at the time of Muhammad sallallahu As the Muslims advanced and they took over Persia, Persia was gone, the last Persian Empire. There was a place called Qadisiya, and we spoke about it last week. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was the commander, the great companion of the Prophet and the Prophet's cousin. And uh, there's a little story I want to share with you about that when the Persian Empire was conquered. Within it, there was a battle in Qadisiya, one of the last battles against the Persians. And the Muslims defeated them. There was a companion by the name of Abu Mihjan al-Thaqafi, 
This man, he was a companion of the Prophet and he had embraced Islam at his time and he was still living right up to the time of Umar. This man, Abu Mihjan, used to be an alcoholic. And unfortunately, before converting to Islam, he, had, he was addicted to alcohol. He became a companion of the Prophet He fought in jihad with them and in battles. He prayed the nights and the days. He gave sadaqah and zakat. He was among the most righteous, but he had one single major problem, and that was his addiction to alcohol. He could not leave it. He couldn't leave wine. Can you imagine a sahabi of the highest caliber drinking wine and getting drunk? He couldn't. And such is the way Islam is. Someone converts to Islam new. We don't attack them by making them uh, or, or we don't go up to them, overwhelm them with forbidding everything under the sun for them. They're new to Islam. It needs time. The first thing you start with the important things and then slowly other things go off. You know, there was a story of a man who entered Islam. I don't know if it's true, but one of the sheikhs talks about it. He goes, a story of a man who entered Islam. And everyone in the masjid said, Allahu Akbar. He sees a sea of beards coming up to him and hugging him as we do. And then the people started to overwhelm him with so many, you know, things about Islam. They said to him, now that you've become a Muslim, you've got to go straight to the hospital and get circumcised. The guy was probably over 30, 40 years old. He goes, man, I don't want to go get circumcised. The Muslims who were around them were a bit ignorant. They said, you have to, it's compulsory, otherwise you're not a Muslim, which is not true, of course. It's a sunnah to get circumcised. But they said, you have to, if you don't, you're not a true Muslim. The guy got overwhelmed. He goes, listen, listen, I just want to rethink about Islam. Can I take it back for now? They go, if you apostate, we'll chop off your head. He goes, what kind of religion is this? If you enter Islam, you chop off your thing, and if you get out of it, your head is chopped off. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is not Islam, of course, and this is not the true way. There's no need to do all of that stuff. So, brothers and sisters, this, uh, this person entered Islam and he used to drink alcohol. He couldn't leave it. And the punishment for drinking alcohol, just to, it, 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 the punishment is more of a deterrence. The Sharia comes with five objectives, and one of it is to deter people from intoxications and losing their mind. And as we know today, we all know, anybody who opens up, does a little bit of research on the internet, will see that um, there are studies upon studies which are factual that tell you the number one, uh, the number one reason for domestic violence in the world, or the cause of the most violence in domestic, in domestic violence, is alcohol. Alcoholism. So Islam forbids it for a reason, of course, and it's only to protect the people and have families and have a peaceful environment and community. Anyway, this guy kept drinking alcohol, and then what happened is that they used to punish him. The punishment was 40 lashes. It still is like that. 40 lashes is not one that cuts his skin, but rather more of a humiliation in front of people in the hope that he will deter them and in the hope that others can see this and not want to be humiliated in public. So it's more of a shame. Stay away from alcohol. So this guy always got whipped and right up to the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, would just drink and get whipped every time. He thought to himself, so long as I get whipped, I atone my sin and I'll just keep drinking so long as I get whipped. I'm doing my Jews, you know. I'll go to, in other words, like I'll go to prison and come out, go back to prison. So long as I'm paying, I'm doing what I'm getting punished for. And he used to increase in his, he, he was a great warrior. He used to fight in jihad and hoping to die in the, protecting the Muslims and Islam and thinking that maybe if I do that, all my sins will be forgiven, including, including the alcohol. So in this particular battle, Al-Qadisiyya, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, who was the commander of the army, he, he had him with him as one of the warriors. And he was one of the most tremendously skilled warriors. He had a, a very unique way he attacked and fought, all right, in the battle. And Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas came and approached him and found him drunk. He said, Subhanallah, you drank again. He said, listen, we're going out. I have to, I, instead of whipping you this time, I'm going to imprison you. We don't have time for that. And he imprisoned him in chains. And as he was imprisoned, obviously they're in a place where he could hear the fierce battle outside. He became very anxious. He wants to go out and fight and help with the Muslims. He wants to, this is his, his wish. Asad ibn Abi Waqqa's wife, uh, whose name was Salma, she was there monitoring him as a guard. And Abu Mahjan begged her, please, Sister Salma, get me out of these chains. Let me come out. Let me go and fight. And I swear to you, if I am still alive, I will bring myself back and put myself in the chains. Just let me help the Muslims. I can't bear sitting in there. 
um, and watching my own brothers die. So he swore an oath and he said, let me borrow Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas's horse. His horse is called his Al-Balqa. And Al-Balqa was a very unique and quite a unique horse that galloped in a certain way. He got onto his horse and covered his face and went out into the battlefield. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is watching and he sees this warrior go in with his face covered. As he's fighting, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is flabbergasted. He looks at it and says, I could almost swear that that horse is my horse, al balqa And I can almost swear that that man who is fighting is fighting exactly like Abu Muhjan. But Abu Muhjan is in chains locked up in prison. I, I don't get it. He was, he was amazed, he was shocked. When he returned, truly Abu Muhjan went back, put the horse back and put himself back into chains. And Salma, his wife, told him what had happened. He said, now it makes sense. I could have sworn it was my horse and it's Abu Mahjan. But instead, he went to Abu Mahjan and gave, because the way Abu Mahjan fought, he fought such a fierce battle that with him, because of him, the, the, he played a big role in the Muslims being victorious in that army. And because of his fierce battle, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was so impressed that he said, Wallahi, I will never imprison you or whip you again for drinking alcohol. You know, he said, I cannot imprison someone who loves Muslims and Islam so much. Upon saying that, Abu Mihjan said, and I will never touch a drop of wine ever again. The only reason I drank is because I knew you would imprison me and I'd pay for it. But now that you won't, I'm going to have to answer to Allah, I'll get punished there. No, 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 I can't. And he stopped drinking wine altogether, subhanAllah. So that's the little story of Abu Mihjan al-Thaqafi radiallahu anhu. The story is in Al-Bidayah wa Nihayah by Imam Ibn Kathir for those who want to look at it. And it's quite famous, yani, this story, subhanAllah. And this is very similar to the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu There was a man who was called uh, uh, An-Nu'aiman ibn Amr. He was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu had a similar situation. He was an alcoholic. He couldn't stop the wine. And he would come to the Prophet sallallahu every time to get whipped. Until one time, a man from among the companions, he said a bad word. He said, ما أكثر ما يؤتى به Oh, look how many times he keeps doing this. In fact, one of them, he said, curse him. Curse him how he has no shame in front of the Messenger of God. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, لا تلعنوه فوالله ما علمت إلا أنه يحب الله ورسوله. He says, please don't curse him. Wallahi, I know that he loves Allah and he loves his Messenger. And the hadith is in Bukhari. So the man truly does love Allah and his Messenger and he is ashamed of what he does and he goes to get whipped every time and gives himself, he's not trying to run away, right? He's not trying to justify something. There's a difference between people who justify the haram and the people who do the haram and feel no sh shame and a person like him who is just addicted to it. He really tries to stop and he can't until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted him. So we do not judge people by the open sin, my dear brothers and sisters. All of us have sin. All of us have secret sins if it's not shown in open. And we give everybody the benefit of the doubt. We advise and we cover up for each other's sins. And we don't, and as one Rasul is said also in the same hadith in Al-Bukhari, he says, uh, to, he said to the companion who cursed him, he says, لا تعين الشيطان على أخيك. Don't assist the shaytan against your brother. That brother, because of your curse, he could probably go and drink more out of anger and the shaytan would make him more angry and put it in his head. So sometimes, brothers and sisters, our words can cause greater harm than good. In fact, I remember from the story of Ibn Taymiyyah, the great scholar in the uh, 12th, uh, um, 11th century when, and the 12th century when the Mongols attacked the Muslims, they converted to Islam and they used to drink a lot of alcohol. And uh, they were so used to shedding blood and getting angry and fighting and they were still new to Islam. One day Ibn Taymiyyah saw them drinking alcohol and didn't say anything as he was going to the masjid. And his companions around him said, Ya Imam, how could you not tell them you saw a munkar, you saw something which is wrong. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you must command good and prohibit evil. And he said, yes, but not when, when prohibiting the evil will lead to a bigger evil. These people, can't you see them? They're still new to Islam. And when they are sober, they fight a lot. And the blood of Muslims is more important. So I thought to myself, for now, keep them drunk where they're not aware. At least they won't shed blood until they've gotten used to being Muslims. So subhanAllah, sometimes you may see something that's wrong 
And you've got to think, if, if I say something right now, or if I forbid this person, if I do something, is that going to lead to something worse? Or is it going to lead to something better? And not many people know this wisdom, Yani. So if you see it leading to worse, back off. Back off. So this is something that many Muslims don't understand very well, and we need to learn it, insha'Allah ta'ala. The best thing to do is that if you see somebody in sin, the best way to do is to advise them in secret and in the best manner without exposing them and humiliating them, making them feel embarrassed, my dear brothers and sisters. You all know the story of the man who urinated on the corner of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. The hadith is in Bukhari, the Bedouin who didn't know any better. And uh, the companions wanted to go and rebuke him, hit him, bash him. The Prophet ﷺ said, leave him, leave him, let him finish. He said, let him finish. The guy's urinating in the masjid, he said, let him finish his urination. Otherwise, something will happen to him. He's worried about his health. He said, someone get some bucket. He, without the guy hearing, he said, get the bucket. Just, you know, throw some water without the man seeing. Don't humiliate him or embarrass him. And then Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went by himself and called him over in private and said, oh, so-and-so, uh, this is not the place where you can do this. Meaning what you're doing is normal. Nothing wrong with it. But this is not the place. And he said, Wallahi, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't know. I'm a better one from the desert. I, I thought this was an open place where we can... You know, do our thing, because that's what they used to. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiled and moved on. Very simple, my brothers and sisters. So this is how we call people to Islam, inshaAllah. The second thing I want to talk about with Umar radiallahu anhu's time is that by the 23rd year of Hijrah, so 23 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated from Mecca to Medina, where Islam was established and Islam flourished, Western historians called it the Islamic Golden Age from the 6th century or the 7th century till about the 15th century, the Islamic Golden Age in which culture, technology and science had flourished among the Muslim world and spread throughout the world and we became the role models and leaders of all of that. It began from Medina, from when the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. 23 years after that, only 23 years, my dear brothers and sisters, Persia, the superpower of the world, had fallen and surrendered to the Islamic Empire, the Khilafah. No more Persia was left. It had reached, the Muslim army had reached to East Pakistan. Why to East Pakistan? Because Persia had also ruled up to parts of the East of Pakistan. So the Muslims reached there and took over every single land that the Persians had threatened the Muslims with until Persia retreated and left. And subhanAllah, reaching Pakistan makes me think that it's probably why Pakistan today, almost all of its people are Muslim. And the commander, his name was Al-Hakam, he wanted to advance and go all the way out to India. He wanted to advance even more past Persia to India, past Pakistan. But Umar ibn Khattab said to him, stop, you're not allowed to go beyond that. Don't go to India. Why? Because Umar ibn Khattab was not after land and conquering. He just wanted to eliminate the threat of any enemy to the Muslims. And the Persians were the greatest threat who never stopped. So he eliminated that to the point where Umar ibn Khattab, you know, he, he, he had this famous saying, I wish there was a mountain of fire between us and the Persians so that we could live in peace. He had no interest in the Persians even. But the Persians were always a threat. They were, they were not stopping. Not only to the Muslims, but to the whole world. To the Christians even. All of them. And I wonder, subhanAllah, when they, the Muslims didn't get to India, but they got close. And I wonder maybe why India today, majority of it are non-Muslim Hindus. 80% of it or more. And uh, all, uh, only about 10 to 14 percent of them are Muslims, even though it's a very large number, 172 million Muslims today, but only about 14 percent of it or 15 percent of India is Muslim. And I'm thinking, subhanAllah, had Umar advanced, would it be like Pakistan? But this is not the purpose of Islam, not to, 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 to militarily force people into Islam that way. So long as they're at truth, there's no threat from them, we have no business with them. So that was the story. The last Persian Empire died alone in Central Asia 
a decade or so after the Muslims conquered Persia and it came under Islamic empire. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, you think how, how did these Bedouins and these Arabs in only 23 years coming from behind camels and dung and they used to sleep on the floor and they had no particular civilized living that the whole world was advanced in, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lifted them from what they were to now becoming the leaders of the world, subhanallah, in those, in, in, at that time, in only 23 years. Why? Because they stuck by Allah's guidance. They were true brothers and sisters to each other. And I'm going to describe some of the characteristics, the descriptions that the Romans described the Muslims and how the Copts in Egypt also described the Muslims. I'll just let them describe why they were so victorious, bi'idhnillah. Remember when I told you about Khalid ibn walid radiallahu anhu? He became the amazing commander general like no other mother has ever given birth, into, birth to even till today. Western historians talk about his chivalry and his command. No, they learned so much from the way he, his art of war. Umar ibn Khattab had told him not to be commander anymore because he feared that the Muslims were putting their trust too much in him. He wanted them to put their trust in who? In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and never to attach themselves to a man. And I, we spoke about this two lessons ago. What happened was... The Muslims entered Damascus. Damascus was among the last places of the whole of Sham, of the Middle East, where the Romans and the Byzantines had still had strong hold. And among them were Arab Christians who were under them. What happened? They entered into Damascus at a time where Khalid ibn walid knew, because he had traveled there a lot, he knew that whenever one of them has a... He, he knew that the governor had a newborn child. And the entire city had a public holiday. So they got drunk, they celebrated, and they were not ready for any attack. At that moment, Khalid ibn Walid seized the moment, and such was his amazing brain. They seized the moment and took it over immediately with minimum casualty. At that point, Umar ibn al-Khattab had realized that he had made a mistake. Why did I take Khalid Walid off? And he said his famous statement, May Allah have mercy on Abu Bakr's soul. He knew men better than I did. He put Khalid in the right place. I did not remove him because of any fault Khalid did. I was afraid Muslims will become too heavily, too heavily dependent on him. Anyway, Khalid has earned himself the rank of commander once again. And so that's how Khalid Walid came back. Truly, as the Prophet ﷺ called him, Sayyifullah al-Maslul, he was the unsheathed sword of Allah. You can't stop him. And Abu Bakr was right. But perhaps that little moment that Umar took him off taught the Muslims to trust in Allah once again because maybe they were losing the plot a little bit. Never attach yourself to a human. Even Rasulullah ﷺ had to die and Abu Bakr ﷺ stood up and said, whoever worshipped Muhammad, he has died. And whoever worships Allah, he is everlasting, will never die. My dear brothers and sisters, in Damascus in Syria, the great commander and ruler Heraclius, if you ever heard of him, Heraclius, the great of Rome, when he saw the Muslims do what they did and his armies could not defeat them, he realized their amazing strength. And I want to tell you something about Heraclius. He was not only a commander and a ruler, he was also a scholar of his scripture. He knew the, the Bible inside out. And when he saw the Muslims that way, he could have kept fighting and get reinforcements from Rome. But instead, he got up and he decided not to take up arms anymore against the Muslims and retreated in peace. And he said his famous statement. He looked at Syria, because Syria today and Syria then, it's beautiful. The most beloved place was the Middle East to the entire world. It's amazing, beautiful, if it wasn't for the corruption. And he said his famous statement, Goodbye, O beautiful land of Syria, never shall I set my eyes on you again. Heraclius said these statements. Why did he say these statements? Because his scriptures, he understood them. He knew that the Romans and the Byzantines had oppressed and wronged the farmers and the simple people of the land and he knew that the Bible had been foretold 
by Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, in a parable, which I will mention insha'Allah soon. When Heraclius retreated, he went to Rome, but he went to Constantinople. Constantinople today is in Turkey. And, or should I say Turkey? And that was still under Rome. When he settled there, he started to ask more about these companions. So every time someone came along, he would ask him. And there was once an ex-prisoner of the Muslims, ex-prisoner, a Roman ex-prisoner who left. The Muslims had released him. And he said, tell me about what you saw in these Muslims. Tell me, what is so special about them? What kind of people are they? And the man said, O emperor, to Heraclius, they are fearless warriors by day, praying and weeping by the night. They don't take anything from conquered people without paying for it. They conquer a people and they still pay them. They don't take it by force when they want something from them. Wherever they go, they carry justice and peace with them. But if a people fight them, they will not give in until the enemy gives in. And the emperor Heraclius said another famous statement. If they are as magical as you say they are, they are sure to conquer the ground under my feet. What was the ground? Constantinople. And guess what, brothers and sisters? Constantinople was conquered by the Muslims. Maybe a couple of hundred years later, but it was conquered. <laughs> Subhanallah. Why did Heraclius leave without a fight? And how could he predict such a thing about the Muslims conquering? Well, he had studied a verse in the Bible in Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 to 43. And there is a parable that Jesus Christ gives, apparently, about a people that owned a vineyard. People of the vineyard, they are farmers. And he gives a long parable saying how you will oppress them, and once you oppress them, God will, will give your kingdom to another people who you dislike because of your oppression of the weak and so on. And in the last verse it says, and this was, in the last verse it says, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. Which kingdom? The kingdom of Asham, Damascus, and the kingdom of Jerusalem. And Heraclius knew that they had oppressed the farmers and the people there, and they knew that they had done them wrong, and that the foretold sayings of Jesus Christ were going to get to them. Who were these people that took it over? Allah sent the Muslims, who were the enemies of the Byzantines, and he gave it to them because they were just and fair. And that's why Heraclius asked about them. And this, in fact, he remembered a letter that the Prophet Muhammad had sent him about 20 years before that, in which the Prophet said, If you turn away, then you will carry the sin of the vineyard growers. Of the vineyard growers. Heraclius, the Roman Christians, uh, he said, I was flabbergasted. How did Muhammad, this prophet of theirs, know about what is written in our scripture in Rome? about what Jesus had foretold about the vineyard growers. So all of this came to light when the Muslims finally came in and took over Syria and Heraclius left, knew that these were people of God. These were people of God. Ironically, ironically, when Umar radiallahu anhu entered Jerusalem, subhanallah, he cried. And do you remember last week when we said when the treasures of Persia were brought to Medina and everybody's rejoicing, Umar radiallahu anhu is crying. They said, why do you cry in a time of victory? He said, I fear this wealth. Any people that it entered upon, any nation, it entered their hearts and they began to fight each other for material and for wealth and money. And it destroyed them. I fear that it will destroy our people as it destroyed them after we became victorious. And look at the state, subhanAllah. So the problem is not wealth, but rather what people allow the wealth to do to them. Now we come to the beautiful part that I like and that is the fall of Jerusalem why is it good for me why do I love it because it is one of the most peaceful conquests in history 
You will never hear a conquest like this in history so peaceful and so divine and so religious on all fronts, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews. All of them come together on something that is divine. And the Muslims, Allah gives it to them. How? The Christians in Jerusalem, they had given up hope of the Roman help. The Arab Christians in Jerusalem, they gave up on the Romans because the Romans had, had fleed. And they decided to give in to the Muslims with a contract of peace. Over there, there was the great Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, one of the greatest companions, Ten Promised Paradise. There was Amr ibn al-As. Remember that name, Amr ibn al-As. Try not to say it in English, just say, you've got to get that out. Amr ibn al-As, that's his name. And he was a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They placed siege on Jerusalem because when the Romans exited, who's going to, under which empire is it going to be? Now they're vulnerable. Anyone can come and take over Jerusalem. So Umar al-Khattab said, go and take Jerusalem and look after its people under the Islamic empire. So they went and laid siege and gave them a chance. They said, give it, give it up. Either surrender, either, either become Muslim if you want. If you don't want to become Muslim, pay a tribute. Jizya, which we said last week is not more than $400 on a person, Australian dollars per year. And if you can't afford it, you don't pay anything. And that would be used to protect and, 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 and help them anyway, it goes back into them. And they didn't want to give it in. So they went to their bishop. And their bishop knew the scriptures. And there is something in their scriptures that says that Jerusalem will fall after oppression. So the same as what Heraclius said. And the person who will be given the keys to Jerusalem, they had a, literally a key to the gates of Jerusalem, by the name of Imr. Ain Mim Raba Imr. Three letters in their Bible. And that was an Arab, Arabic speaking Christians. Who was Imr? Now we said that one of the commanders there was Amr. But in Arabic, you don't spell Amr with three letters. You spell it with four letters. Ain, Mim, Ra, and Waw. So it's like Amru, but it's pronounced Amr. Spelt Amru, four letters, and, and pronounced with three letters. So they came up to Khalid ibn Walid, radiallahu anhu. He approached them, and he said, you're going to surrender or what? They said, in our scripture, it says that the keys shall be given to a man that will come to take it named Amr. Do you have a Imr among you? And then they said, oh, they're probably talking about Amr. Amr ibn al-As. Amr comes along and goes, oh, my name is Amr. But when they wrote it down, they said, no, you got four letters. In our Bible, it's literally three letters. Then Khalid ibn Walid said, you're talking about Umar? Umar is three letters. They said, who is Umar? They said, he's our Khalifa, our Caliph. He said, we will only give the key to your leader of the believers to Amir al-Mu'minin Umar radiallahu anhu so they wrote a letter to Umar radiallahu anhu and he said okay let me ask my advisors around me Uthman radiallahu anhu said Ya Amir al-Mu'minin I say stay here they might attack you but Ali radiallahu anhu suggested no go on your feet and inshallah everything will be fine so we took Ali radiallahu anhu's advice and he left Ali to look after the Muslims as they were going, he entered into Jerusalem. Something funny happened. The, the people there had a custom. Their armor that they wore from the Byzantines, had, so if you're not fighting, you had to wear an armor that was shiny. It had some silk on it. It had some jewelry on it. It looked quite luxurious. Now the Muslims weren't used to that. Omar was always afraid of Muslims getting too luxurious and getting wealth into their hearts. He's already got trauma from it. So when he entered, he sees Abu Ubaidah and Amr ibn al-As and all the other great, great, great companions wearing these luxurious vests and a bit of silk on it. Not full silk, you're allowed to wear a little bit of silk. Or silk that's mixed for men, mixed but not too much. It's halal for the women, haram for the men. So is gold, gold is haram for men, halal for women in Islam. And if you want to ask why, just Google Science Daily or any scientific article, the effect of gold on male testosterone or male hormones, and you will see that it inhibits it. 
but it's good for women. It increases the estrogen, so it's more feminine for women. And subhanAllah, Sadaqa Rasulullah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this. Sorry guys if I get on a tangent of science sometimes. It is my background, sometimes I like to talk about it. And the effect of silk on male hormones. So anyway, Islam is a religion of human nature. So he didn't like what he saw. Umar ibn Khattab, knowing him, he looks at them and he literally picks up little tiny pebbles of rocks and starts throwing them at them. He said, how could you? I haven't even left you for two years and already it has entered your heart. How soon is your victory going to fall? How soon are you destined to failure? The dunya has taken you over. He just, he lost the plot. Abu Ubaidah comes up to him and says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, take it easy, take it easy. He says, this is the custom of the people. They wear according to their status. So when we entered, we came in here, we wore the armor that they look at. They're used to thinking these are not simple people. These are strong people. And it made that effect. This is half the victory. This is why we wore it. Not for any, not because of luxury. And then he calmed down. When he saw Abu Ubaidah, because he loves him so much, Abu Ubaidah came to kiss the hand of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen, before he kisses his hand, he goes, if you, he, 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 he kneeled down to kiss Abu Ubaidah's feet. You see, he's Amir al-Mu'mineen. And Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah, Amin hadi al-Ummah, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, called trustworthy of this Ummah. Umar the Allah, the Amir, he doesn't care about his status. Everyone is equal. And he looks at Abu Ubaidah, the great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet spoke so highly of him. Abu Ubaidah wants to kiss Amir al-Mu'minin's hand and Amir al-Mu'minin goes to kiss his feet. So then they both just stop because they're not going to give up. And they entered with this utter respect, Amir al-Mu'minin wearing simple clothing. It is said that his servant was riding on his camel while he was walking on the, on the ground. And the Christians were so impressed by what they had seen and it made them increase in their faith that truly he is the man to give the keys to. So they gave the keys to Umar radiallahu anhu, cutting the story short. And Umar radiallahu anhu went and wrote a letter, a contract. And this is what he wrote. From the servant of Allah and the commander of the faithful, Umar. The inhabitants of Jerusalem are granted security of life and property. Their churches and crosses shall be secure. This treaty applies to all people of the city. Their places of worship shall remain intact, untouched. These shall neither be taken over nor pulled down. People shall be quite free to follow their religion. They shall not be put to any trouble. And because of that, the bishop was so impressed by this. He's never seen that from anybody, even from their friends, the Roman Christians, who oppressed them. He said, oh, I, we have never met people like this before. And we prefer you than them. <laughs> then it was time for Dhuhr or Asr. And the bishop offered Umar radiallahu anhu to pray in their most important church. It is called the Church of Holy Sepulchre. This church still till today exists and it is still called the Church of Holy Sepulchre. So the bishop offers Umar anhu to pray his salat inside this church. Now in Islam, you are allowed to pray inside a church or a synagogue, or any place of worship. Just try your best not to face the statues. You're allowed. However, Umar radiallahu anhu refused to pray inside the church. And you'll never guess why. Some of you may know it. He instead prayed on the doorsteps, like near, sorry, near the doorsteps of the church, very close to it, in a way to make the bishop feel that he wasn't disrespected. And in a way that he's not inside the church. And you know why he did that? He said, I do not want to pray inside the church because I fear that after I am gone, the Muslims will change your church into a mosque and they will call it Umar's Masjid. And he wrote in the contract, 
he added, after praying at the doorsteps, he added the words, the doorstep shall not be turned into a mosque, nor a sermon be said from there. Even the doorstep that I just prayed there, he made sure, because he knows his people. He says, you're going to turn this, he goes, this will not be turned into a place of worship, nor can you deliver your khutbah from it. Don't think about that. And it's still written with us till today, subhanAllah. So he went after that and he prayed another salat in another area close by where Bayt al-Maqdis is. And subhanAllah, we have a mosque built there shortly after his death called the Mosque of Umar. Had he prayed in the church, the church would have been called, as he said, subhanAllah, the, the, the Mosque of Umar. So, radiallahu anhu and how truly as he was, al-Faruq, the divider of truth and false. And he had a very sharp uh, intelligence. He knew people and he knew his flock very well. Radiallahu anhu wa arda. In Sahih al-Bukhari, it is recorded that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam foretold this moment. A companion said, I went to the Prophet during the expedition to Tabuk while he was sitting in a leather tent. And he said, count six signs that indicate the approach of the end of times. My death. My death is a sign of the last hour. The conquest of Jerusalem is a sign of the nearness of the hour. A plague that will afflict you and kill you in great numbers as the plague that afflicts sheep is a sign of the closeness of the hour. And then he talked about wealth being an abundant to the point where people will not even be poor enough to take zakat and people will not even be happy with 200 dinars, which means that people are not happy with a wage of $2,000 or something like that. It means nothing. Uh, and he talked about uh, a big war after a peace treaty under which 80 flags will gather against the Muslim people of the world and the Muslims will defeat. They are the, uh, later on, the, uh, a crusade will be done against them and so on. So a lot of these signs, some of them have happened, some of them are yet to happen, only Allah knows their nature. But certainly the conquest of Jerusalem happened at that time. And then a plague happened shortly after that. And now brings us to the plague. But before that, Umar al-Khattab, went to a man called Ka'b al-Ahbar, a companion who used to be a scribe, a scholar. And he said, where, where do you think the story of uh, Jesus Christ is? And, you know, the stories in the Bible about where all that stuff happened. And he pointed to where the Solomon, the, 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 um, where we see now the, uh, the Masjid al-Aqsa is built and the gold dome of the rock in that area. He went there. And that is where Rasulullah had gone in his Isra' al Maraj. And Umar al Khattab entered from where the Prophet entered. He prayed as the Prophet prayed. And then he went to a particular place there where they believed that Jesus Christ had been crucified, but it wasn't Jesus Christ, of course. And there was a grave there of a man who had been crucified instead of Isa, as the Quran tells us. And Umar found that it had been turned into a trash yard into a garbage place and another place that belonged to the Jews turned into a garbage place why the Christians and Jews had it for each other and they both started to desecrate each other's places Umar al-Khattab cleaned it all up and turned it into a place of a masjid and truly over there there is a masjid called Masjid Umar as we said before my brothers and sisters the Jerusalem conquest and the Muslims having a stronghold there was in the year 680 something and it lasted all the way till about the year 1099 when the Crusades came back and threatened it. And then we hear the story of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. So for nearly 500 years, it stayed under the stronghold of Muslims until the Muslims began shaky. And they began to disunite because of materialism and the world creeping into their hearts until the time of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, then came the plague. Now, because of the coronavirus that passed, we spoke so much about this plague. It's called the Plague of Amawas. Cutting the story short, there was a plague that came out, as Prophet said. And really, 
so many Muslims had died in the tens of thousands because of the plague. And the story is that uh, the hadith is in Bukhari. Where Umar ibn Khattab was going there to check on the Muslims. And Abu Abayd ibn Jarrah was in there. He had been afflicted also with the plague. And Amr ibn al-As was there as well. And he was looking after them. And they were all stuck inside of that place. Syria, Iraq, uh, parts of Egypt, and so on. And when he arrived, he stopped. Amr ibn Khattab did not enter. And he wanted to seek the advice of his counsel. After the, his counsel said, I think we should return and not enter because of the plague, Abu Ubaidah, the great companion, came up to Umar anhu and he said, What are you doing, ya Amir al Mu'mineen? Afirarun min qadarillah. Are you running away from the qadr of Allah? And Umar looked at him and said, Law kana min ghayrika, ya Abu Ubaidah. I wish anyone else but you would have said such a statement. Meaning, you are a scholar. Only an ignorant person will speak what you spoke, Abu Ubaidah. Why you? Out of all people. He said, yes, I am running away from the Qadr of Allah to the Qadr of Allah. So taking precautions is also part of Qadr. The fact that you took precautions, the fact that you took the medicine, the fact that you took, um, you know, you saved yourself and you went away, this is all part of Qadr. If anyone wants to learn about the meaning of Qadr, I did a five part series here in the masjid. It's on the Facebook page and also on YouTube. The Qadr and Qadr, I answer all these um, confusing questions for you. And he said, uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf said, I heard the Messenger وسلم, say, if you hear about a plague in a town, do not enter it, and if you are in there, do not exit it. Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu thought of a good idea, and he said, let everyone leave the town and spread into the hills away from each other. <laughs> Social distancing. And that's exactly what they did, and it's exactly what they did, and it worked. Alhamdulillah, the virus could not survive, it could not find a host because people were far away from each other. Yes, people died and the, ho and the virus became weaker, subhanAllah, until it died. So among the first people who practiced this uh, measurement were actually the Muslims. And they kept doing that until the fall of the Islamic Empire in 1924, World War I. My brothers and sisters, another thing I want to talk about is a time called the famine. So in Hijaz, in the Arab lands, in the time of Umar anhu, there was a famine. Nobody, everybody was poor, people couldn't eat, people couldn't, it was poverty, people could, they were starving, they were dying of starvation. Umar anhu, he refuses to eat and people would bring him food and meat and everything and he refused to eat. Why? He said, I will not eat until the people have eaten and the famine is gone. Wallahi, I will not. If I do not suffer, how will I know what suffering people are going through? If I do not suffer, how will I know what the suffering is that people are going through? I want to feel what they are feeling so that I can do my duty as the leader. La ilaha illallah. Do you understand why they are called Khulafa al Rashidun, my brothers and sisters? What a true Islamic leader is, what true Muslims are. He used to eat bread. So stale bread and oil. This was the time that his skin had changed color and his stomach had, you could see his rib bones and his stomach was um, concaved in, in and he got very sick, refusing to eat even though the food was all around him. He said, give it to the people until the plague is gone and people have eaten. That's how Amr al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was. And because of the famine, anybody who stole, the thieves is very important, anybody who stole, he would not punish them. Because you know in the Quran it says, The thief, man or woman, you need to sever their hands if they steal. Now obviously there's a whole jurisprudence about that and understanding. It's not if you steal a little bit. It has to be a lot. And there are conditions to it. You would have known the law. You would not have been forced. Also if you weren't in need, if you weren't hungry, um, all that stuff has to be established first. And you don't sever the hand for all amounts. It has to be a big amount, an amount that causes damage and harm. So it's not a very straightforward punishment. 
there are other punishments. However, because of the poverty, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu suspended, suspended a law in the Qur'an. You might say, how could he stop a law in the Qur'an? He has to carry it out. This is kufr, some people will say. But now we understand, no, it's not kufr. Because the Rasul sallallahu said, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnat al-khulafa al-mahdiyin al-rashidina min ba'di. To follow my sunnah and the sunnah of the khulafa that are rightly guided after me because they understood what the Quranic verses meant. It means that in a normal society where there is no poverty, but when people are in danger, people's lives are in st at stake, you don't apply the punishments in the Quran anymore because the reason that there is punishment in, in the Quran is not to punish and hurt people, not to make lives harder, to make lives easier, to protect people's property so that people can feel safe, so that people can go out and if they lost their property, it will come back to them. You know, I gave an example to my students one time. I said, listen, imagine somebody is poor and they've got a daughter who's got asthma. A little daughter who's seven years old got asthma and these people are saving up to buy the asthma pump. They live in a land where they don't have any welfare, like in Australia, they don't have any of that and the country is poor. And they've got a daughter who's got asthma and they have to buy the, the asthma pump and they've got to save all that money and they're already not eating enough. Imagine a thief comes and steals whatever savings they have, even if it's a little bit. They come to buy their daughter the asthma pump, they've got no money. They can't get one and the daughter suffocates and dies. Wouldn't that, how would the family feel? The result of theft. Theft causes death and killing and the thief doesn't know what he's done. So my brothers and sisters, there's always a reason and a wisdom behind the objectives of Sharia. The objectives of Sharia are five. What is the Sharia for? Five reasons. To protect life. All the laws around it, the whole objective is to protect life. Number two, the whole laws around it, the halal and haram, is to protect faith and religion. People have the right to worship with freedom. People are not forced to enter into a religion they don't want to. Number three, the whole laws of Sharia. Ah. Objective is to protect the intellect. That's why alcohol is forbidden. Number four, to protect dignity and honor. So the people are not raped, people are not committed adultery, STDs, uh, HIV, AIDS, people's honor, adultery, fornication. Families can stay intact to protect the dignity and honor of people. And lastly, to protect um, wealth and people's property to protect people's property Allah says in the Quran وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ in the laws of punishment O oh people who have a brain and intelligence to think you can have a life through punishment you can have a life so the only one I remember one of my lecturers teaching us law at one stage I did business law and a Muslim student, there was something in the paper about severing the hand. And my lecturer, who was a lawyer, said, well, you know what? It works. And then he says, who's the only one, who's the only one who is afraid of this punishment of theft anyway? The only one afraid of it is the thief. So if you're not a thief, you have nothing to fear. So there's much more wisdom to talk about it, but I'll just suffice with that one, inshallah. Lastly, brothers and sisters, I want to talk about this and then we'll finish next week. The last pieces of conquests that in the time of Umar, they did, and we're going to learn something from it, is Egypt, among the last, before Uthman came along. The Romans had colonized Egypt and colonized its indigenous peoples called the Copts. The Copts, Al-Akbat, the Egyptian Christians or Orthodox Christian, and they are still there today. Well, you can't call them Orthodox, they're Copts, Coptics. Uh, and there was what we call the Imperial Roman troops. Imperial meaning the Roman Empire had colonized and taken it over. And what they were doing is they were charging them huge taxes, and the Copts weren't happy under their rule. A battle broke out between the commander Amr ibn al-As who had been entrusted and the imperial Roman troops in Egypt. The Roman soldiers fleed. That was only part of the area where the Copts were. And the Muslims did not harm the Copts. Why? Because the Copts are the indigenous people. They're not at war with them. But Amr who kept back some of the Copts from among them 
And he said to his troops, keep these people with us so they can, just for a few days, so they can watch how we live our lives. Maybe, maybe they will feel at peace and ease with us and know who we really are. Very smart. And these people watched the Muslims and then he returned them back to their, what we call the Viceroy. The Viceroy is another name for um, Governor's General or the leader. And he asked these men, how did you see these Muslims? These Muslims just entered and, and made the Romans flee. How, how, how are they? Tell me about them. And this is what the Copts said. This is still written till today in a tabari and Bidaw Nihaya in our books. It says, our Lord, the Copts said to their Governor General, their Viceroy, our Lord, the Muslims are a people who love death more than we love life. They love death more than what we love life. What he means, what he means is that when it comes to protecting their religion and their people, death becomes more beloved to them than to live in humility. But they love it as much as we love life. Meaning, if the going gets tough, we'll run for our life. But they will keep, well, they will stay there even if they have to die. Well, martyrdom, yani, martyrdom. For a Muslim, it's martyrdom. So I'm going straight to paradise, inshallah. They love humility better than pride. Greed is unknown to them. They do not think it degrading to sit on the ground. They eat without sitting at a table. Now, it's not haram to sit at a table, brothers and sisters. Don't get this wrong. But that was their custom and tradition. And for them, in those days, if you eat on the ground, you're of a lower class. So what he's saying is, they're not afraid of sitting with the poor, and there's no such thing as higher class, upper class, and lower class, and because you eat at a table or you don't. That meant nothing to them. This is not how they valued people or separated people. They eat without sitting at a table. Their commander is just one of them. There is a special mark about him. The Muslims know no distinction between the high and the low of the master and the servant. When the time for prayer comes, they all wash up and stand shoulder to shoulder in all humility before their Lord. The leader, the viceroy said, such a people will overcome any power. It's better we make peace with them. And so the Muslims and the Coptics, they made a peace treaty and they became allies. And the Muslims took up arms to defend and protect the Copts. And the Coptics helped the Muslims to get rid of the Roman imperial troops from all of Egypt. And the entire Roman army left Egypt from their colonization. And the Muslims gave gave the Copts, the indigenous people, left them in their lands, they didn't touch their churches, they didn't touch their religion, they even had their own court system, they ruled by their Bible, and the Muslims supported them. Subhanallah. And Umar wrote a treaty of peace between Muslims and Coptics, that they will protect them, security of life and property and freedom of religion. In return, the Coptics helped the Muslims in their fight against imperial troops of Rome, Rome was angry, but the cops didn't care because they liked how the Muslims treated them until all Roman troops were out of Egypt. Brothers and sisters, this is why there are still Coptics now in Egypt, even though they are a small minority. How did they survive when Muslims had been in Egypt all the way till now? Muslims have never ever left Egypt since the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. So for those who talk about Muslims and Islam and saying they're out there to kill people and convert people by the sword and kill all non-Muslims, one amazing argument that you can use, one, one of many, one of thousands, is this one. How is it that if this religion is such a barbaric, treacherous, terrorist religion, that they entered Egypt, the indigenous peoples of the land stayed in there, they were secured, and they are only a few people minority, they could have wiped them off. And the Muslims have never left Egypt ever since the time of Omar till today. And the Coptics still have their respect and honor in the land. They still have their places. That is a proof of what Islam came with really. A living proof. You know, brothers and sisters, subhanAllah, it brings to mind, I'll just finish it with this now. Here in Australia, for example, in Australia, 
we all know about the um, British colonization. We all know about Captain Cook and, and, and those before him and, and after him. And we know what happened, what they did to the indigenous people, the aboriginals, and how we all know about the stolen generation and the terrible atrocities that are unspoken of. Truly, truly, they were terrible, terrible, terrible atrocities, Allahu Akbar, unspoken of. Um, and then we finally had in, um, uh, when, when Paul Rudd, Paul Rudd? What is it? Kevin, Kevin Rudd. Where did I get Paul Rudd from? An actor. You got me. All right, so Kevin Rudd, um, and he did something good in his time here. He did the national apology to the Aboriginals. That's nice because they stole their children and Christianized them. But what you would be amazed, and this is factual evidence, I just don't have it in the textbooks anymore in the schools, but his, his history teachers know this, that um, the Muslims from Indonesia, the Makassans, actually were already in Australia way before Captain Cook and those before him. Um, they were there before the settlers. The settlers were the convicts who were who became settlers later on, who were thrown out of Britain, the criminals, and they were thrown into Australia. But anyway, even before them in the 1600s, there are cave drawings. There are cave drawings, Aboriginal cave drawings, of interaction between them and the Makassan tribe of, of Muslim Indonesia, Muslims in Indonesia. And they, show, uh, they also show that they traded food and certain types of rice between them. No Muslim ever harmed the Aboriginals, rather they did trade with them. And there is a, a brother by the name of Rocky, he's an Aboriginal, uh, who lives in Moree in New South Wales, mashallah is an active brother in Dawah, whose ancestors, he says, I don't know, he has a, a clip about him saying that I remember my grandmother, she told me about wudu, and she says, oh, we used to see our ancestors, they used to wash five times a day and bow their heads down to God. So there is evidence to show that it is possible some aboriginals converted to Islam in that time, or at least took on some of the Muslim traditions. In some of their cave drawings, they have funerals that are similar to Muslim funerals, to the Janazah prayers. So you can actually Google this, it's, it's now all over the internet, alhamdulillah, information and access to information is very easy. So I just wanted to just show, subhanAllah, how Islam really did spread, and even when it was military uh, expansion, how the military expansion was done in such justice and, and different to everyone else that ever came in history. And that, alhamdulillah, the glory of Islam is still there in our history books. Today, the Muslims... Um, Alhamdulillah, we are what we call a sleeping giant. Uh, but our deen is in our hearts and our Quran is in our hearts. And I'm so proud to see in this masjid how many young people in front of me who are increasing coming in the masjid even while, subhanAllah, we see the other side as well. We, we, we feel that Islam is, is going and that Muslim youth are losing the plot. But on the other side, subhanAllah, on the positive side, we also see a large number who well, alhamdulillah returning to their deen and uh, learning their religion and not only in Islam but also they're getting their education and, and they're able to differentiate between what's good education and what's not. So they learn at university and are able to say, listen, I'm not going to fall for this trick because I know what my deen says. And mashallah, they flourish. So I'm very proud of those members of our community and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide those who are still misguided. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins and reward you all. I'll stop here now, alhamdulillah, and we have just one last bit about Umar radiallahu anhu. Basically, I want to talk about his, the way he governed the city and some of the initiations that he brought into this world that are now practiced in law and in government, especially here, even here in Australia, in a lot of Western countries that were actually taken from Umar radiallahu anhu. One example is Centrelink. Uh, the welfare system and another example is separation of powers so for those of you who know about that we'll talk about it inshallah next week how Umar radiallahu anhu and the khulafa established these laws a long time ago and are still practiced today هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين